Well, Dr. Alloway, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so looking forward to this. Well, I am too, because I am fascinated by the brain. And I know this is an area of, of discussion and topic and expertise for you. So first, before we dive into all my questions, can you talk, uh, can you first introduce yourself and share a little bit about the work that you do? Sure. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Dr. Tracy Alloway. I'm a licensed psychologist and a researcher. I've published over 100 scientific articles looking at the brain in different areas like memory, mental health, social connection, and so on. Uh, I've written 15 books. My most recent one is called Think Like a Girl, where my real goal here was to explore some of the myths that we hear as women, or even that we tell ourselves, mm -hmm. and looking kind of behind the curtain to see how our brain is actually working and whether that matches up or if it's disconnecting with the mm -hmm. myths that we hear. Okay, so let's talk about some of those myths. What before we go into um, the brain discussion, what are some of the myths that women tell themselves? One of the things that I hear a lot is that women are emotional when we make decisions on distress. Mm -hmm. And I actually start the book with that particular one because, you know, as a woman, I was curious as well. And so in order to uh, explore that in the research lab, I brought people in. And I presented them with um, these dilemmas. They're called trolley dilemmas. Um, they've made its way into popular media. Some TV shows have featured them. But essentially, we know from research that people view these dilemmas so critically that they show these same physiological response, the stress response, as if they were having to solve them in real time or in mm -hmm. real life. So here you have, you're standing at train tracks, a train is hurling towards you. You can see it's going to harm five people. You can save them by switching the track the train is on. Only one person will get harmed instead of five. What will you do? And we do know from, again, brain research that there are two pathways when we make mm -hmm. decisions a cold pathway or a rational pathway that's housed in the prefrontal cortex, the front of a brain, and a hot decision-making center, this emotional brain, which again, women often get um, suggested that we use this part of the brain when we make decisions. So I wanted to know, first of all, does it resonate with what I see in the lab? And second of all, can we change that? Or is it kind of hardwired for us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found that indeed women do, uh, you know, men and women make these decisions, but the interesting thing is that we're able to switch that decision-making metric. And I found that if we induce a little stress, so when I asked my uh, participants in the lab to stick their hand in a bucket of ice, this is called a physical stressor, it overloads our hot brain center, our emotional brain, the amygdala. And so that emotional brain is busy tending to this, this uh, pain stressor that's happening. Mm -hmm. And as a result, our prefrontal cortex, our rational brain is free to kind of look at everything, look at all the options and make a decision. Interesting. Um, yes. So, so basically what that, and that is counterintuitive for me that I was not what I would think. I would think, oh my gosh, someone just stuck my hand into a freezing cold bucket of water and I'm not going to be able to think rationally. But it sounds like that is not in fact what happens. That's correct. So actually what happens is that emotional brain is so busy handling this cold ice stressor that yep. our rational brain is free. I also found something really interesting, which is that when women um, are kind of given this label of being emotional decision makers, it's actually coming from a place of protection. That there's a lot of research to show that women are motivated by a need to protect. So for them, wanting to not even harm one person in this hypothetical mm. dilemma is so powerful that they can appear to be emotional decision makers, but it's actually coming from a very powerful and protective place. And they want to they want to gather up and nurture and protect as many people as they can, even in hypothetical scenarios. And I think for me, that was a game changer. So it's not just that, you know, decision making on the surface may just seem emotional, that we're not able to make these decisions under stress, when actually it's coming from a place where how can we protect as many people as possible rather than a, a straight, cold, utilitarian metric? So in this scenario that you're talking about with the train, trains hurtling down a path, mm -hmm. down the tracks, what is the difference between how women would would tend to make decisions as it relates to that, uh, which, you know, which way to go, the, the route where you're going to hit the five or the route where you're going to hit the one uh, versus how men would make that decision? 
That's a great question. And I was curious to find that out. And I actually found no difference between the two. So it just bunks, yeah, it kind of bunks, you know, debunks this myth that women tend to be more emotional, that we're going to struggle. Some of the women did vocalize feeling stressed from it. But mm -hmm. when you actually look at the data, there was mm -hmm. no difference in how they actually make that decision. And let me guess, though, that both groups, men and women, decided to save the five. Is that, <laughs> that fair is, to say? That is an excellent guess. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that uh, we're tracking here. Okay. So you are an expert on the brain. Can you talk about some things that would surprise? I mean, you already mentioned something that I think would surprise people about how women are perceived, but can you talk about some other things that would surprise people to learn about the brain? I think it, when it comes to risk, that was also a surprising myth uh, for me as a researcher and an author writing the book. But again, the myth we hear is that women are poor risk takers. And if mm. you look at the science, it does support that. But if you look a little deeper, a lot of that is because the way risk is defined tends to be very adrenaline fueled, uh, you know, jumping off cliffs, motocross riding type of activities. But when researchers include real life risks, like mm -hmm. moving across the country, maybe giving up your job to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. the kind of risks that resonate with what people actually do in real life, we find no difference between when men and women in that mm -hmm. risk taking respect. What we do see is a difference in the metric that women use to make a risky decision. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that women tend to include emotions more in the decision making, mm -hmm. so much so but if that decision will give them a positive feeling, so let's take this example. You are you know, given an opportunity, you have a stable job, steady income, insurance, and so on. It's great for you, great for your family, but it's just not where your passion lies. And you have an opportunity to kind of, you know, shelve that and pursue something that is your from scratch, you don't know how it's going to turn, turn out. It's high risk. And it's something, especially after COVID, a lot of women and men, but a lot of us are, are thinking about. Now, research shows that when women view that risk as so positive, so in other words, they're saying this decision will give me so much joy, so much meaning and value, they almost don't even view that as a risk. And when mm. I've had these conversations with women, some of them will stop and think, oh my goodness, you're right. I did move across the country. I did do all those things. I didn't even think of these as high risk decisions mm. because mm. the value added was going to be so great for me. Right. And those, so, so it's almost like in some ways women are able, able to look at it objectively, right? Making decisions with the frontal cortex, I think you said, and trying to make some of those rational decisions, but also almost have an advantage because they are overlaying that with also having an awareness of the emotion that is involved in making a decision. That's exactly so, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what drew you to really wanting to understand uh, the, with with the new book and thinking, uh, think like a girl? What drew you to wanting to understand how women think, ver let's say, versus men? That's such a great question. And as a researcher, I encounter a lot of scientific data. And I noticed that a lot of times it was a broad brushstroke, a kind of one size fits all. And every so often you see these little tiny nuances about the female brain embedded in there. And I began to realize that there are certain ways in which we think and they may not actually be true, like we talked about with risk and even emotional decision making. And in other times, they may find, uh, you know, grounding in science. When we look at mental health, we do see differences in the female brain there that can affect us. And I really wanted to create an awareness what's happening in our brain so that we could ultimately be proactive. Once you know how your brain is working, we can make better decisions. We can know, okay, well, this is how the wiring is. Is it, are we determined this way? No. Mm -hmm. What can I do instead to maximize how efficiently I use my brain? So, so in thinking about what, what do women need to know when it comes to how their brain works and how they make decisions and how they live their lives? Like what, what is important for us to know about that? I think a great point to take away is that women are very motivated by empathy. Mm. It's not from birth. In fact, uh, genetic studies, twin studies, uh, kind of um, in uterus studies have shown that it's not that 
females have more oxytocin, which is the neurotransmitter or the chemical associated with empathy specifically. So we're not necessarily born more empathetic, mm. but socially and culturally, this is fostered. When mm. a mother and, and daughter specifically interact, they, they you know, it's, and it may not even be intentional, but we focus on females being more nurturing, being more caring, sharing more. And this increases oxytocin levels. We recruit something called mirror neurons, like the name suggests in our brains. We mirror. We encourage mm. young girls to look, is someone happy? We're happy with them. Is mm. someone crying? Mm -hmm. Go comfort them. So socially, we encourage these patterns, though this is not the chemical that we're born with more, say, than, you know, the male brain. So I think that for me was very interesting. It has benefits, as we've talked a little bit about already with uh, decision making. If we're looking at, at emotions and empathy, it can also be protective in risk taking and, and stress in decision making. It can be counterproductive in the workplace. And in one of the chapters, I talk about this idea of ruinous empathy. When mm. we have so much empathy for our colleagues, our peers, that we almost don't want to give feedback because our first thought is, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Mm -hmm. But we are not realizing that we're doing them a disservice because it mm -hmm. takes away an opportunity for growth, you know, for progression and so on in the workplace. And so this idea of ruinous empathy, it's a double-edged sword. Empathy is very powerful, clearly, but it can also be damaging in some situations. And knowing that and knowing how to balance that is a really important thing. Yeah. What are some of the differences um, that you have noticed in the way, because we, we um, have explored this as it relates to female politicians running for office and male politicians running for office, as well as in the workplace. And there are certain things that we accept from men mm -hmm. that if a woman did it, we would not accept that behavior. And I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to what you have seen in, in terms of how women might be perceived differently mm -hmm. and maybe judged more harshly mm -hmm. than male counterparts. And then do you think it's evolving? And, and if not, what is it gonna take for it to evolve? That's a great question. Uh, social psychologists call this the implicit bias. Mm -hmm. Like that's it's underlying and we're not even necessarily aware, but we may look at a male leader that's talking about being, you know, a go getter, that type of approach. And mm -hmm. we may appreciate that in a male leader. We think, well, that that is a protective individual. And we're not even intentionally voicing these kinds of claims on an, a subconscious level. We want a leader that is a protector that's going to kind of carry us in stressful times. But when we see that same approach in female leaders, that's not a, a trait that resonates. Oftentimes, again, this idea of implicit bias, we're looking more at nurturing, caring, mm -hmm. empathetic type of mm -hmm. traits in a leader, but it's a hard line because we don't want them to be too soft, but we don't, it's almost the Goldilocks effect. You can't be too hot or too cold. So you can't be too hard or you get terms like you're cold, it's uncaring, or if you're too mm -hmm. soft, well, they're not cut out for the job. They're just mm -hmm. going to buy it. And mm -hmm. so it is certainly, you know, what researchers call the Goldilocks effect, this just right piece. But women do get called up for not being empathetic. And again, it's not intentional. And it's both male and female polars that will respond differently. You know, they'll respond. The pattern is the same across the board. Now, what's interesting is that um, when they did this with leadership styles, they found that for male leaders, especially when they had to wait a female, excuse me, male, uh, you know, subordinates had to wait female leaders, mm -hmm. they were far less trusting of a female leader that adopted masculine type traits that, you know, generically, if a, so they just, I think, in part, researchers suggested felt inauthentic. And the male uh, individuals picked up on that, they thought, well, that's not really how they are. I don't mm -hmm. feel like they're a good leader. And so it's mm -hmm. again, something to keep in mind, this idea of authenticity in your leadership mm -hmm. style. And this does go in with the, the kind of tension between confidence and competence. So we've mm -hmm. heard the idea of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it's a myth that women tend to experience that. There's a lot of research to show that men also experience imposter syndrome. This idea that 
you know, I'm in this job. Am I really good enough? What am I doing here? They're going to find out that I'm an imposter in this role, um, as the name suggests. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, it's, there's a whole body of research to suggest that women will feel like they need to show competence at 100% mm -hmm. before they're confident. But mm -hmm. male counterparts in the same position don't have that same standard. They'll say, you know, 50% of the traits, I have it. I can yeah. be confident. And yes. I think also an interesting to, thing to keep in mind is that it's not so much and research bears this out for men and women it's not so much the traits that we put out it's the confidence that we put out and yeah. that people are willing to select a leader based much more on confidence than competence whatever the field they've done this in in a whole host of different fields not just politicians but if a woman or a man appears confident you know hands on the hips shoulders back the kind of classic confident pose they send a message that I'm confident. And it's almost like we're kind of uh, captured by that, you know, captivated by that. We don't even kind of look at the qualifications. We think yep. that stance, they have to know what they do because they're so confident. Yes. Well, and it's interesting when you talk about that in terms of the traits and how many you feel like you have to possess be as a man versus as a woman, uh, because we have absolutely in the in in work that I did when I still worked at that um, at that very large company. One of the things we noticed was that if you looked at female candidates for a job versus the male counterparts, men were what uh, punching up, so to speak. That right, they were like, well. I think I've done about a third. I have about a third of the qualifications. I can get the rest of it. Whereas women were like, do I have every single qualification that they're asking for? Because then I will know that I can do this job, right? Mm -hmm. We just, women didn't tend to punch up as much mm -hmm. as their male counterparts. And yeah. it sounds like that is, that is supported by the psychology in terms of men, the differences between men versus women. Mm -hmm. There's so much research on that. And so I would say, you know, for a female leader or female individual, confidence goes a long way, uh, sometimes more than competence. Mm -hmm. That's what the data shows us. And yeah. that's unfortunately something as, as women, whether we're interviewing for a job or in a leadership position, we tend to downplay some of yeah. that. And is it, so I wanna ask you, because I'm very curious about this, is it an issue of risk aversion on women's parts? Like, I don't want to mess up or, or is it a little bit slight, is it slightly different than that? In that women, I, I have found in my experience and in the research that we've done that women, we are earnest. We want to make, we want to improve things. We want to make things better. Mm -hmm. We earnestly want to do it well. And is it is it that or is it more the risk aversion? Such a great question. And I would take us back to childhood to answer that question and the way we praise children. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of research to show there are two types of praise, broadly speaking. Okay. Person-based praise, which is you are awesome, you're amazing, and effort-based praise while I saw you working really hard. I can see that you're staying up late, you're studying for the exam, you're practicing. I see you out there in, you know, in the basketball hoop, just making those shots. So person versus effort. And there's a substantial body of research to show that in childhood, boys receive more effort-based praise. And this means that they begin to recognize that if I tweak my behaviors, I can change the outcome. If I didn't get a good grade, it's because I didn't study hard enough. I kind of slacked off. If I didn't make the football team, I wasn't out there running hard, training hard, and so on. Mm. So I can change it. It's in my control to do mm. so. In contrast, young girls tend to be recipients of person-based praise. Oh, you're so pretty. You're so great. You're so clever. You're so smart. And mm. what happens is that that person-based praise becomes connected to their sense of self, mm -hmm. their identity, mm -hmm. their self-esteem. So as they get older, they think, well, I don't want to try something new because what mm. if I fail? That's going to affect my self-esteem because wow. I'm supposed to be smart. I'm supposed to be good at this. And if I'm mm. not, what is that addressing? It's addressing mm -hmm. something internal in me 
not my effort. And so I think a lot of that fear of failure that we see in adulthood mm -hmm. for us as women is connected mm -hmm. to the kind of praise we've received in our childhood. Wow. I mean, that is just mind blowing. I have to tell you, I have not thought of it that way. I think it, it just has so, it has so much merit. It's such a thoughtful way to, consi to, to consider why we are the way we are. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you think about too, the fact that boys have historically, and I'm not talking maybe about my daughter's generation, but certainly my generation, we, there were a lot more team-based sports available for boys mm -hmm. than there were for girls. Mm -hmm. It just, it just, that, that was the reality of my growing up. And if you think about where people get praised for effort versus getting praised for who they are. Sports is a big place that boys get either praised for good effort or, or be, or told you didn't, you didn't try hard enough, right? You're not doing it hard. You're not, you're not doing what you need. You're not applying what you need to apply to do this well. Yes. And it is almost uh, a training ground. Mm -hmm for them at a young age mm -hmm. and, and maybe, uh, and I like, let's, let's, let's hope that that is changing. Yes. And that's my next question. How do you see this evolving and how has it evolved? Maybe the difference between like my generation and my daughters, my, my daughter's generation, how, how do you see this changing? That's a great question. I do notice an increase in awareness to begin mm -hmm. with. Um, and I think that with that awareness, it comes in tension. So when we talked about implicit bias, mm. we're more aware as a, as a society, what some of these biases might look like, and maybe even mm. ourselves, we may stop ourselves. One great example is that women tend to say, I'm sorry, instead of thank you for waiting. We say, I'm sorry, I'm late. So this idea that we have inconvenienced someone else, mm. or we don't, you know, we, we accept all responsibility mm. without giving uh, other parties that space also uh, to mm. accept responsibility. And so I think some of that conversation is shifting where women are becoming more aware that, well, you know, I can't try this. I can't say no, I can't create a boundary. I can understand this about myself and then be proactive here. I can know that I'm gonna be nervous in an interview. I'm gonna have Wonder Woman pose, follow the research, you know, lower my cortisol levels, feel more confident. So I think there's certainly that shift that research is trickling down a little bit um, mm -hmm. outside this, you know, these scientific journals where all of us can become a little bit more aware of how to shift our own mindset. And it starts with the individuals. And I think yeah. I would say that, you know, each person is responsible for recognizing their own mindset and yeah. then looking at how can I tweak that? How can I be more positive, more healthy, more efficient in the way in which mm -hmm. I, I make decisions? Yeah. You know, I, I just keep thinking back to what you said a few mm -hmm. minutes ago about also the effort-based uh, praise or effort-based feedback versus person-based feedback. Mm -hmm. And there is so much there in terms of even how we deal with our children now, right? It's It's also, you know, when you give somebody the feedback, and I happen to have two daughters, um, but when you give them feedback about the effort that they put into something versus making it about them, mm -hmm. like you are good at math mm -hmm. versus you put in a lot of work mm -hmm. here. Do you see what a difference that made in mm -hmm. how well you did on that in, in math? Mm -hmm. It just, it's a, it's a difference in how you deliver it, mm -hmm. but such a change in how they then think of themselves because then they get, they get, they can get older and think of themselves related to the effort they put into something as opposed to them, right? Oh, I'm, I'm not a good student anymore because mm -hmm. if your grades start to, you know, let's say you, you know, your grade starts to fail, mm -hmm. you don't want that child to think, oh my gosh, I am no longer a good student. Right. Right. It's yeah. not, it's, it's about the effort you put in. So 
I know I'm going off a, a bit on a tangent here, but as you as you mentioned the two types of praise, the person versus the effort, it just resonated so much, mm -hmm. not just in thinking about women as adults, mm -hmm. but young women as and and girls mm -hmm. going even younger than that as as they're growing up and focusing yeah. more on that. On and the they effort. are research, there are studies that will look longitudinally. So they look at children over time as well. And they find that the children who receive effort-based praise are more adventurous. They're more likely to try new things because mm. their sense of failure mm -hmm. isn't connected to their self-esteem. It's connected yeah. to effort. So Tracy, can you talk about how we can understand more about the brain and memory and that impact to women in their daily lives? Um, I think an important thing to keep in mind is that hormones do affect memory. So we do see changes in memory, uh, retention, and forgetfulness during the teenage years when hormones are changing. Even during the ovulation cycle, there are reported scientific changes in memory, and oh, certainly wow. during menopause as well, during mm -hmm. pregnancy, postpartum, when there's a shift. So this idea of a uh, you know, baby brain that is sometimes called is mm -hmm. not a myth. There oh. is research and medical evidence to suggest that the estrogen level changes also affect the way in which we use our memory. And so just giving yourself that space and having that understanding can make you, you know, maybe feel a little less tough on yourself thinking, you know what, <laughs> this is going to happen. There's a lot going on. There's some shifts happening. So there, there is that. Um, I've actually launched a memory app. It's called the AWMA that gives five, uh, 50 memory tips based on our five senses. So it's all based on science. So one example is that peppermint oil and rosemary oil, the essential oils, actually improve memory. And this is a, a quick improvement to memory. And the reason for that is that it increases acetylcholine, which is a memory neurotransmitter. It's also the first neurotransmitter to start declining when we look at aging, mm. when we look at Alzheimer's and dementia. So if you have a student or yourself, you're trying to prep for a presentation, or you have to study for an exam, having essential oils for peppermint and rosemary are really quick, effective ways to improve your memory. Another fun one is chewing peppermint gum. A couple reasons for that too. Wow. Yeah, I know it's unusual, uh, but sugar, that shot of glucose, first of all, helps your prefrontal cortex like we talked about. Mm. And that peppermint also has that same benefit on our memory neurotransmitter. Oh my gosh, I love that. Um, <laughs> well, we could do a whole thing on just those, on just the memory. What, uh, what can women do to tap into their mind? What practices are important to maintain and use uh, for brain power? I would refer to the mental health literature, and I have a chapter of this in my book, Think Like a Girl, and recognizing that our neurotransmitters at the female brain has more neurotransmitters that will encourage us to overthink. You know, so when mm -hmm. you sometimes say, well, I can't, it's just playing in a loop. I can't stop thinking mm -hmm. about it. So knowing that that's in part a way in which we're going to naturally gravitate it's important and there's mm -hmm. a lot of great tips one is using the word stop this research so that even that physical sense of saying stop to yourself can take you out of that ruminative or overthinking mm -hmm. cycle mm -hmm. uh, having a practice of gratitude can also shift the scale to a more optimistic mindset mm -hmm. which is language based so mm -hmm. instead of just thinking thoughts that are positive there's a real power to saying it out aloud and using your name Tracy, today I am grateful for this. And yes. the reason for that is because our optimism part of the brain is in our language center, our left part mm -hmm. of the brain. So mm -hmm. using language is a powerful way to activate that. And there's brain imaging studies to support that view. Yeah, I love that. Well, Dr. Tracy Alloway, thank you so much for spending this time with us and for helping to educate us. If people want to learn more about what you do, find some more of these memory tips, what is the best way for them to do that? I have a website, tracyalloway.com. I'm on social media, Dr. Tracy Alloway. I would love to connect more with your listeners. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.